Hi everybody, welcome back. Attorney Steve Vonder and happy Friday. Hope you guys are getting all geared up for a great weekend. Today we're talking about an interesting topic called the Stored Communications Act or what we call the SCA. All right, Stored Communication Act. This is an important topic for litigants, both civil and criminal litigants. I'm not going to talk about the criminal side of things. I don't do criminal defense. Uh, but there are special rules under the Stored Communication Act for criminal defendants and the government. But we're talking about civil litigation. So without further ado, let's head to the Attorney Steve litigation whiteboard. All right, you guys. So this is a very important topic. And, and I really, I looked on the internet. I really didn't find too much about this. So I said, you know, I probably should do a video. Always trying to bring you guys the best videos, trying to educate my peeps out there. All right, so here we go. Let's start over here. We have a litigant. Oftentimes, a litigant gets into a civil case and wants to find out emails that somebody sent. They want to get the text messages. They want to get phone messages that may be recorded and stored or social media posts, things like that. What we have nowadays, we have uh, entities that will store all this information. Quick background on the Stored Communications Act. So this is goes under Title II of the ECPA, which is the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. Now this all came about in 1986. Ronald Reagan was the president at the time. And it was felt that with the emergence of the digital economy, they knew that private third parties, such as these companies that I'm going to talk about in a second, they knew they were going to be holding private information, private emails, things that were intended to be private, things where you have a expectation of privacy. And they knew people, when they litigate, they're going to be seeking these things. So we already have the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution, which prevents the government from engaging in illegal searches and seizures of our persons, papers and effects, things like that, that is written into the Constitution. But it was felt that something was needed for privacy protection of digital electronic communications, particularly stored communications. So there is the Wiretap Act that covers interception of communications in transit, but the Stored Communication Acts, uh, Act uh, protects these kinds of things that are stored on servers, okay? Um, things like emails and text messages, um, Facebook has social media posts, Twitter has, Facebook has direct messaging that you can direct, directly message people. There's all kinds of things. You have Facebook groups, you have Zoom chats and Zoom calls and presentations that can be recorded. So the ECPA is designed to protect the privacy, and I should have drawn a defendant here, but to protect the privacy of third parties that were part of the communication. Maybe somebody sent an email. Um, I did this or that and and the litigant the plaintiff or the defendant may say I need to get that to support my claims or to assert my defenses I need to get at this evidence. So what happens is these companies are what we call the covered entities There's basically two types There's basically two types of covered entities that must comply with the stored communications act first We have what we call ECS these are electronic communication service providers. These are companies that provide, for example, email services, Gmail, Yahoo, AOL, and Outlook. Those are just some examples. Any email service provider would be governed by the Electronic Communication, uh, Stored Communications Act. Anyone that allows for text messaging, these are like your Verizon, your AT&T, uh, T-Mobile, any of these companies, they're also allowing you to send text messages and messages back and forth. They're an electronic communication service provider, an ECS. They must comply. Uh, companies that allow for voice messaging and recording like Skype and Zoom. Okay, so you can Skype and maybe you record the phone call or you Zoom and you record the presentation, sharing the screen and you're recording all this. That is content. Messages that you send back and forth, that is content. There's content to the messages that's what the Stored Communication Act is trying to protect. And finally, you have social media posts, uh, companies that allow you to, uh, like Facebook has groups, uh, Instagram allows you to post messages to certain people. You can limit who you're posting to, you can post to the entire world, you can do what you want. 
And different rules can apply depending if you were posting to the entire world or posting to a limited group, for example. So there's a lot of niches and nuances to this law. I'm only covering the basics in this stored communications crash course. All right. Now, so, and this is not a, an exclusive list. There are many, 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 any companies that allow the transmission of electronic communications can be an ECS, must comply with the Stored Communications Act. The other one we call RCS. This is Remote Computing Services Provider. So this is, these are companies that provide remote computing services. There is a whole slew of them. I just put a few basic ones up here. The cloud storage, you're storing your, your Word docs, your Google docs, your OneDrive, you're storing all your documents and communications and things like that. These can be considered a remote computing cloud services, okay? Cloud services is kind of what we're looking at here. Part of cloud uh, services are SaaS. You've seen SaaS out there, the software as a service. Attorney Steve used to work at a software company many, many years ago. I was one of the first in what we call web-based software. Back then we called it ASP software. And this is your basically your software as a services. It's all online. You rent it, you pay monthly fees. You get all the upgrades, such as like Salesforce. Salesforce is a big one. Uh, there's multiple CRM systems, a lot of real estate CRM systems that allow people to send messages and, and things back and forth. These are all storing communications on their servers. And again, emails, texts, posts, uh, attachments to emails, all kinds of things. So these, this is the content that is protected. The Stored Communications Act is all about the content. If it's content that this litigant is seeking, whether a plaintiff or defendant, these guys get the subpoena. Here we go. Whoop. Subpoena's coming up there. Subpoena's saying, I want all the emails between this person and that person. Give me everything they said. I want to know everything. The, the service provider, the person governed by the Stored Communications Act, should come forward and say, hey, hey, whoa, 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 I cannot give you content. I, we're not allowed by law, Stored Communications Act, to give you the content, sorry, and they will probably give a notice to the person who is subject to the subpoena and let them know, hey, they're seeking this information, you could go quash the subpoena if they're seeking content information or they just won't provide it. So a lot of these things get worked out between attorneys as the case is going, if that's what they're looking for. But a lot of times you'll see um, the, a well-crafted subpoena, I should say, will not be seeking content from one of these two. They will not be seeking content. They will be seeking basic subscriber information, what we call BSI. Basic subscriber information can freely be provided. So can non-content. And non-content, you may see something like this. I, you know, I don't want the contents of any messages, any text messages. What I do want is dates that this email sent to this email, dates that this person sent to that person, things like that. If it's strictly data without the content of the message, meaning the meaning and the purpose of the message of a, an electronic, an oral or electronic communication, then that is proper. We have that here basic subscriber information, non-content to, from, various metadata, things like that. So if, if they're providing this, that is totally fine. Either one can provide both. If they're providing content, any wire, oral, or electronic communication regarding the substance, purport, or meaning of the communication, they cannot provide that because that is content. You cannot provide these entities, these covered entities as we call them, cannot provide that content without an exception to the Stored Communications Act. The basic one being consent is one of the big ones that you consented to it. Um, one of the parties may say, okay, um, I agree, I consent, or maybe there's a court order where the court, um, you have a, for example, a, a, a um, search warrant, okay? Like a government search warrant, okay? Search warrants are uh, a little more powerful than just a subpoena because a subpoena is not based on probable cause. I mean, there should be some good faith to it, but a uh, warrant is based on probable cause issued by a court, and that can be some grounds, an exception 
where this can be provided. Another one I have down here, to protect the rights of a service provider if somebody's suing um, X or Twitter, for example, and says, I want all these communications and this and that, they're allowed to disclose contents to protect themselves. They're allowed to do, take actions to protect themselves, okay? So this is a basic overview. You can find the law over here, 18 USC 2701 to 2713. And again, the whole point of this law is to provide some measure of privacy in the digital age. And if you get a subpoena that's not well crafted, you need to, as an attorney, um, you need to be taking a look at that as you law students look for this on your bar exams. And the Stored Communication Act comes under Title II of the ECPA, the Electronic Communication Privacy Act. So there you have it. There are some penalties for violations. They're not real beefy in my mind. There can be civil and criminal penalties. There could be a $1,000 minimum penalty and attorney fees. So there are there is a little bit of bite to it with that attorney fee clause. But there you have it, guys. This is general legal information only, not legal advice. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you have a great weekend planned. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, drop your comments if, you, if there's something you want to add. Uh, I cannot give legal advice online. I know a lot of people ask. I'm sorry. I wish I could, but I can't. Uh, but don't forget to subscribe. And again, have a great weekend, everybody. Attorney Steve out. If you need some help with litigation, intellectual property law, entertainment, technology, internet law, those kinds of things, you can find me on the web at attorneysteve.com. That's attorneysteve.com. Remember, don't get mad. Give them the finger. Have a great day. Bye now.